our lecture focused on issues of race and racism and how theology can deepen our reflection on race and racism. This year we, we cover a, a different topic entirely, but these topics are united by our commitment as a school of theology to offer some, uh, to do public theology, that is, to offer the theological tradition uh, to our community as a way of deepening conversations about issues that matter. Um, last year, certainly to help in our reflection on race. This year, particularly as we are situated in Silicon Valley, to deepen our reflection, our consideration of technology, robotics, um, artificial intelligence, and the ethical tradition, particularly the, the Christian, Judeo-Christian Judeo ethical tradition. What can that say to questions about technology, artificial intelligence in our time? So we are blessed to have here uh, Mark Graves uh, to help deepen our reflection on this aspect, one aspect of uh, this kind of reflection. Mark is uh, known to, to some of our faculty. Mark is a uh, alumnus of the, of the Jesuit school, school of Theology, having earned a master's degree through the Graduate Theological Union. But before that, his first career was in um, computer science, earning a PhD from the University of Michigan. He's currently at the University of Notre Dame as a visiting assistant research professor, and he is working on the intersection of artificial intelligence, or AI, um, psychology, and moral theology. Um, his books include one book titled Mind, Brain, and the Elusive Soul, and another, Insight to Heal, Co-Creating Beauty Amidst Human Suffering. He has completed postdoctoral fellowships in uh, genomics, or the Genome Project, at Baylor College of Medicine, and in psychology and neuroscience of virtue at Fuller Theological Seminary in Caltech. And he has 10 years of experience developing scientific and data-intensive software in biotechnology, pharmaceutical, and healthcare industries. So he is really going to stretch our boundaries here. Uh, Many of us, including myself, do not know much about artificial intelligence or robotics. Um, Mark is going to uh, be gentle in his explanation of that aspect of his research. But for those of us here, familiar with ethics and theology, he will only deepen and challenge us to think more broadly and deeply. So Mark, welcome back. Nice to have you here. Thanks, and uh, good to see some familiar faces and new faces um, here. Uh, and you know, thanks for, for bringing me back. It's a pleasure to be back in Berkeley and uh, uh, be here again at the, the Jesuit School. Um, so I'll, um, uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, artificial intelligence. I'm actually going to kind of start um, not so much with uh, the language and the text, but do something a little bit more visual, uh, because it's a little easier to I mean, see uh, what, what's happening. And then I'll move more into the, uh, into the, the text analysis. And along the way, I'll explain what I mean by cultural analytics and uh, machine ethics. But the AI is kind of the most pressing uh, social issue right now, uh, and so, I'll talk a little bit, of, kind of introduce that uh, first. So, so I want to talk a little, use some visual examples to kind of give an idea of, of what the issues are in having an AI system um, that tries to do something as human as we think of as you know um, moral reasoning and moral thought. So, how many people uh, see a dog? All right, so a little less than half. So I point out it's, it's kind of a little hard to see, but there's a Dalmatian, there's the ear, the collar, the leg. Uh, and we're generally pretty good at like picking out and making patterns out of, of visual images. Um, in fact, uh, in a sense, like with a projector, everything is going to be dots. You know, you, you're, you're connecting the letters, you're connecting all of the things in pictures. And so that's something that, that humans are actually pretty, pretty good at. I mean, there's a, certainly a cultural part of it. Like if you had never seen a Dalmatian before, then you would never see a dog. 
uh, within this image. But the way that AI works is they, have a, they see things different. They have a different visual system than we do. So who can tell me what uh, they think some of these images are? Anyone? Yeah. In the one in the first one looks like steps. Steps? Okay. Yeah. The last one looks like symbols clashing together. Oh, symbols, yeah. That's good. The last one of the third row looks like a face. Yeah, that does look like a face. Yeah. And so like we, we can find the patterns within that. For an AI system, what they see is, they do, they see the uh, AI system, we see that, a particular AI system, she says it's a ski mask, that's a monarch butterfly, a bliss, uh, my favorite, school bus. Um, <laughs> but, uh, this is a projector. Uh, and so what these images are, are building a model of the, of the vision system and then just kind of kind of running it backwards. So this is, in a sense, the essence of what an AI system sees as a school bus or a monarch uh, butterfly. And uh, <clears throat> what's interesting is that, well, like with the, uh, the dog, you know, maybe a third of you saw that, you know, up front. Um, for these images, the particular AI system um, has a 99% confidence that this, this is a school bus, or that's a monarch. So this is very clear to an AI system what these are. And that tells us something about the AI systems and the way they process in that it really doesn't need wheels to consider something a school bus. You know, it, it really, um, you know, this is a traffic light. It's 99% confident that's a traffic light. So if someone puts on a t-shirt with that image and stands in the road, the you know, autonomous vehicle is going to see that as a traffic light. Um, <laughs> and so the, these images just kind of give us a little bit of an indication that, the, that there's, the AI system is processing stuff differently than, than we do. And so when we move on to like think about reason, reasoning, this is you know some of the steps that are involved in human reason, in human reading. So like this is the central lobe. It's, it's kind of like this this uh, brain is kind of facing mine. The, your vision, your optic nerves go from your eyes to the back, and this is where the early part of vision happens. And then for reading, it kind of comes through, and there's kind of a lower pathway here, which is kind of more meaning and then I have an upper pathway that's more spatial uh, through here, uh, and then moves more into the, the motor cortex where articulation and pronunciation happens. And so one of the reasons that, like with the Dalmatian, that we could see that is because we share very similar brains. But for an AI system, it doesn't have the biological brain. It's got a series of programs uh, that are embedded within a system with cameras and LIDAR and various other ways in which it sees. And so it's hard for us sometimes to conceptualize that difference. But one of the things we are actually good at is conceptualizing that there is a difference. Um, and so for humans, sometimes this is called like mind reading. If not like I'm thinking of a number between one and a hundred reading, but the ability to infer what is on somebody else's mind. So, like I can sit, like I can stand here and think about what have you, you know, thought about AI? What have you heard before? You can sit there and try to think about, you know, what I'm talking about. Some of the, like, you know, the previous citation, I was explaining what someone was in computer vision was doing to you. And so we're, as adults, humans, we're very good at kind of keeping that straight. Um, that's what allows for drama and soap operas and romantic comedies. It's the idea that we can keep distinct what different people are thinking about in, in the world. Now, for very young children, uh, um, most other, most primates, uh, a little bit delayed development apparently for uh, children with autism, they can't distinguish between their understanding of the real world and somebody else's understanding of the real world. 
And so if you try to explain if, you know, one of the stories is, so like if, uh, if you know, I uh, hide something under a box and then, uh, and somebody sees that and then the child, uh, that person, the child sees that person leave and I move it, then when the person comes back, um, then you can see that the, uh, for an adult, you would expect the person who's to look for that object to look where they saw it. Whereas for the child, they can't distinguish between where the person saw it and where uh, they know it is. And so the same thing is kind of happening within mind, mind reading. We're able to actually think, I mean, sometimes I have an image to describe that, and talking about it now. Like I'm telling you about what a child would think about an adult, who's interacting with another adult. And it's a little confusing once you get about four or five levels of interaction, but we're able to actually do that. And so the issue is that for an AI system, unless we build in that capacity, it's not going to have it. It's not something that kind of comes for free. Most animals don't have it, higher the primates don't have it, children don't have it. And without that ability to understand what we as humans think of as moral behavior, then an AI system's just not going to be able to do that. It's not going to be able to understand because it has a different embodiment. It has a different way of looking at the world, literally and figuratively. So, it's going to, so if we want AI to kind of understand human morality, then um, what they're going to have to do is actually find some way of simulating our mental process because it doesn't have a brain. Part of how we are able to understand what someone else is doing is because we've got the shared brain. So if I'm hold, when I hold the, the laser pointer and point at something, then as you see me hold the laser pointer in, in my hand, there are neurons called mirror neurons in your brain that are activating in the same way that they would activate if you were holding the laser pointer. And because of that shared embodiment, the similar embodiment, then you're able to kind of build upon that. So when I point at something, then you're able to just kind of follow that very naturally. But for a computer program, all of that needs to be built up. So we as social animals are very good at that kind of social cognition. But the uh, artificial intelligence systems have none of that. What they're good at is develop processing text uh, very fast. They're good at um, uh, high-speed computation, but they're not as good as picking up on social cues. So if we build these models of human morality, then it's going to help us understand morality. It's just a different perspective, a different method, a different tool. Um, but it can also help an AI system understand human morality that it's not going to be able to understand. I mean, we can question whether like an advanced AI system should actually have a similar or different morality. But one of the things we will want before we can even have that conversation with uh, advanced AI is for them to understand what we mean uh, by morality. And so the idea of, so one, one thing that that can lead to is kind of as we're trying to develop kind of an AI morality, then that fits into what's called machine ethics. So ethics, there's kind of two complementary fields within ethics. So machine ethics is how do you get a, a robot or an AI system to act in a, in a morally behave, behave in a moral way. The kind of complementary uh, approach would be like uh, ethics of technology or technology ethics, which is how do we interact with a robot system. So questions of, you know, should we uh, weaponize robots? You know, is it okay to, you know, ex to, you know, beat on robots? At what point, you know, do we need to treat them as being sentient, the way we interact with them? But the machine ethics is how will they interact with us? So one approach is to just try and keep drawing, making boundaries and restrict the behavior which is okay for simple AI systems, but as they get more and more complex, then uh, a good approach is to start embedding uh, an understanding of human morality within the AI systems so that they can at least have conversations with us 
about uh, that kind of behavior. And eventually that may lead, if uh, some projections you know, continue to work out in you know, a decade or two or three or four, where AI will continue to develop uh, further and further and perhaps even develop its own type of morality. And hopefully that's kind of a, a best case scenario. I mean, the real danger and part of why there is kind of some fear associated with AI is that if we don't build into AI systems the ability to understand our morality, to understand what suffering and flourishing looks like to humans, then there's really no way that a, an AI system that's developed that is so differently embodied and developed without that is going to kind of stumble into something that's good for, for humanity. So the approach it's going to take is, um, it's called cultural analytics of morality. So cultural analytics is another kind of emerging field like uh, machine ethics, which is using uh, computers to, to discover, interpret, and communicate meaningful patterns in cultural data and to create these models and visualization for questions of cultural significance. So cultural analytics work across the humanities and social sciences and we're focusing specifically on uh, moral theology and, and ethics. So we're using the computer in order to understand human ethics. So then once we develop these models, then that helps us understand uh, human morality better, better and can contribute to fields that study that, like moral psychology, moral theology, and ethics. But then also, once we have these models that we think capture some uh, essence or some deep aspect of human morality, then those can be embedded within AI systems. So it may be robots, uh, it may also be uh, more distributed AI systems that are like processing text and identifying, for example, people that are you know, posting on social media, you know, kind of what's the moral intent um, that they may have. And being able to automate that is something that would then open up a range of opportunities for us to then um, uh, develop a better technology uh, to handle you know, some of the things that are uh, that happening there. So the goal is to develop these uh, models of human morality. So I contribute to academic investigation, uh, AI understanding human morality, and then possibly these components for autonomous AI. And so the way we're going to do that is to actually process these morally, religiously, and spiritually significant texts. So I, you know, for, for this talk, I'll talk about you know, Thomas Aquinas. And so as a kind of a source of within culture. Now, for humans, like the way we learn morality is you know, through education, through friends, through family, through these social cues, you know, fables, stories as we grow up. But that's because we're social animals. And so we're tuned to pick up a lot of things to learn socially. But for an AI system, uh, its strength is computation, not social awareness. And so for an AI system, what I'm saying is like, what the way to have it uh, learn moral system is to feed in texts that were very influential on human understanding of morality and ethics. So from a kind of Western perspective, you know, Thomas Aquinas, you know, other moral thinkers. And although that's something that's kind of hard for humans, for a computer it can process, I mean, in the model that I'm, I'm talking about, like all of the summa in less than a minute. And so we can feed in all of these different texts and create these, these models um, that then give us a new perspective on morality, but then also uh, kind of build upon the AI's uh, the strength, uh, and then use these you know, uh, in other applications. So a couple of things before I kind of uh, dive into the application I want to kind of focus on. It's like I'm talking about like understanding. So, so what do I mean by understanding? So you can think about like you know, theology is faith-seeking understanding. So understanding in that context can even have like metaphysical implications. I'm talking about it, you know, at, at this level, something you know, a little bit more, just kind of understanding the ideas and concepts. So what are the ideas and concepts in 
a uh, in uh, uh, the in the Summa for Aquinas. Um, this is also uh, it. Kind of also gives us a little bit of a path. Right now, we're talking about understanding. Uh, what's happening in Aquinas. The next step could be kind of applying it. So this, uh, this kind of diagram, Bloom's taxonomy, comes from ed education. Uh, it's basically how do you build up critical thinking uh, in, in students. And so, you know, you, as somebody's learning a new area, at first they can just, you know, some remember the facts and then understand it, and then build up where they can apply it, analyze, evaluate, and then create. So this is not necessarily the way to teach an AI system, but it provides a useful model that right now we're trying to, you know, computers are great at remembering. I mean, we've offloaded a lot of our memory, calendars, uh, addresses, phone books, off to computers. That, that part is, is uh, very well done. And so now we're trying to see, well, can we shift some of our understanding? Can the computers actually help us to create an understanding of theology in this kind of an academic sense, not necessarily in a metaphysical sense, and then build up to some point in the future that we may be able to have AI systems actually creating uh, a novel uh, interpretation. So, um, so that's kind of like what I mean by understanding, but then I'm also talking about model. So what's a model? What is it that I'm trying to build? So a model in general is anything, is a type of abstraction that highlights some significant aspects and de-emphasizes less relevant features. So, uh, a uh, can have an architectural model, and so that you can see how a building is going to look like. You can have an engineering model. You can take a model of an airplane, put it in a wind tunnel. In biology, biological organisms or model organisms are helpful for understanding human physiology. Uh, in bio, uh, bioengineering, uh, we have like a, a model of an arm that has, you know, ignores a huge aspect of human biology, but is so good if you're developing a prosthetic in order to understand what it is that uh, is needed for the prosthetic arm. So the model that we're going to build of Aquinas is what's called a topic modeling. So. So we're going to actually build a model of the topics, ideas, the concepts that are occurring through the, through the Summa uh, as a way to abstract a certain perspective of the Summa that, uh, and ignoring other, other aspects. So a, what a topic model is, is, is saying that you can model a conversation or a document by the topics that occur within it. So, you know, as I've been talking, I've talked about Aquinas, I've talked about AI, I've talked about computers, I haven't talked about the weather, I haven't talked about basketball, I haven't talked about the traffic. And so you can kind of classify in group conversations that you have, things that you read by the collection of topics. And so what we're going to do with the Summa is we're actually going to pull out what are the topics of, of Thomas Aquinas that is writing in the Summa, and then uh, look at how those, those topics uh, uh, and the, the pattern of topics, what that tells us about the structure of the text. So uh, most people here know who Thomas Aquinas is, heavily influential on the Catholic Church, so even if you don't know who he is, he's still uh, influencing you. But the Summa uh, was, uh, written to, as kind of a compendium of uh, medieval theology that is explaining theology to uh, theology students in medieval times. And so it's a good source of that kind of concise description of theology. And we're going to focus primarily on what's called the, the second part, which is his moral theology mainly uh, his understanding of humans as moral animals, and then also specifically the, the virtues. So this is a topic visualization of a topic model of uh, the first part of the second part of, of Aquinas. So it's, um, it's a little fuzzy, I can't... Uh, uh, 
Um, so you, you can't see the, the small print. I can't even see it from here. But base, and, and I'll zoom in in just a second. But basically, these right here are there's 60 topics. So um, according to one way of looking at the topic model, then at one level of abstraction, you can talk about uh, the Thomistic moral theology is being comprised of about 60 different topics. Now, the moral theology itself is one topic, but at a um, kind of a uh, information theoretic perspective, then uh, there's basically 60 topics that cohere pretty well and distinguish themselves from each other. Uh, and then along the top are the questions in the first part. So this is you know, one moving up to the other question. And then the brighter areas are those where that topic is occurring within the text. Let me zoom in a, a little bit. This is the upper <laughs> corner. So, um, so basically, just starting going through the questions, then the first topic at the beginning of that part of the Summa is, is right here where it's, it's brighter than others. And so that's a topic about the end things and intention. And so there's a topic that the software is pulling out of the text, saying that, uh, that for Aquinas, there's this kind of end thing and intention. Uh, so it kind of fits within his, his natural uh, theology. Now, it's not actually what the intention is. That's actually kind of coming down here. And this is where you know, happiness and perfection is occurring. And so there's kind of a transition from talking about the end thing to what the end thing is. And then it's coming back up and um, talking about the, the act being voluntary. And if you kind of, if you're going reading through the text, instead of looking at every word, what this is doing is saying, all right, we're talking, starting to talk about this concept, and then here, and then he's moving to this, and kind of gives you a, a sense of how um, the structure of his text is going through these different topics. But what he's also doing, so like, even though like some of these, um, which is uh, here like the passions, uh, you know, even though it clearly kind of starts, you know, here uh, within, I can't read that, within like, you know, the, like the, you know, 22, 23 uh, question, you can see he's kind of, he's kind of hinted at it previously, and then after this he periodically comes back to it. Um, and so there's a way in which uh, you can kind of visualize a little bit of his method and how he pulls things together, goes in, into some depth, and then periodically kind of ties it, it back. Um, and so this is something that, I mean, if you're learning the Summa, uh, can actually be uh, uh, kind of a, a helpful tool. But um, this is also uh, just kind of like one, this gives kind of one perspective on his moral theology. Now, um, I'll come back and say a little bit more about this, but I want to switch over to a, um, a, 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 a different model. I won't go into any details. This is what's called like a neural network model. So the, the, the topic modeling is, that's been around in computer science for about 15 years. I mean, this is certainly the one of the first applications to theology, but the, the technique has been around for all. And that neural networks have actually been really over the past few, few years, even though they've been around, there's been, as we get more data and, and faster, then we're actually able to build a model, not just of the topics in Aquinas, but actually the language and how he writes. Uh, and so this is a, a neural network which was fed uh, the Summa and then told to just generate text. And so this text here, uh, even though you know, it, it looks you know, kind of like it might have some, some structure of Aquinas, you know, like articles, objections, you know, quoting Augustine, talking about the existence of God, uh, talking about perfection. This was generated by software that processed the Summa knowing nothing but the characters that were being fed in. So this language model did not know English, it did not know Latin, it knew nothing of theology. All it knew what knew was the Roman alphabet and was then able to kind of make these kind of predictions of, of what it would sound like 
uh, for uh, Aquinas. So if you text on your phone, you know, sometimes if you've got predictive text turned on, sometimes they'll try and anticipate what the next word is uh, that you might say. And sometimes it, it has a good suggestion, a lot of times it doesn't. So this is kind of a very sophisticated way of doing that, kind of character by character, and then generating something that should sound like Aquinas. This is a, 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 a similar model um, that uh, basically has a pre-processing step where it creates some chunks. And so, you know, some of these, you kind of have to, even if you know Aquinas, a, a moderate amount, you have to kind of think about, are these statements true? Are they false? Are they trivially true? Um, and again, these were statements that were, do not occur anywhere in the Summa, but are statements that at least have, or uh, uh, at least indicating an understanding of Aquinas that you might expect from like a, a, a graduate student beginning their study of Aquinas. Um, and so um, it's still, it's not a, a deep understanding, but computers are actually getting to the, the place where they're starting to have something that uh, at least causes, uh, at least it's pointing toward, you know, sometime in the future where they may have deeper and deeper understanding. So, so far I've talked just about like one text of Thomas. Um, and so some additional work uh, that, you know, doing is, uh, you know, I mean, a part of studying Aquinas, looking at Aquinas is he's been well studied and so there's a lot of information there and a lot of people that can give feedback on how the models we can also use computational support for like you know, critical editions, uh, working on a critical edition of uh, Irenaeus right now. Uh, there's some interesting kind of computational uh, issues because I'm, I'm showing like a translation of Aquinas, but when you're talking about building a critical edition, then you're talking about multiple texts and multiple languages fragmented. And so how do you build up an understanding there? And the idea is that if we build, continue to build up these tools um, where it's not just one text for one figure, but we start bringing in other texts of Aquinas, the people that influenced Aquinas, contemporaries, those that Aquinas influenced, build up, you know, 20, 30, 50 figures, each with their representative text. As we start to kind of build up that critical mass, we're going to uh, find new patterns that we, that we haven't seen before. Um, so part of this is kind of just going by analogy with what uh, has happened recently in biology. So within biology, you know, as computers started becoming more involved in biology, it was first, well, you know, I mean, it, it made things a little bit easier and it helped grad students kind of track some of the genes. Um, but people that were, uh, geneticists, they typically kept track of like 20 or 30 genes uh, that they were working on and had a sense of, of how those were interacting. Um, but then computers, as they became more and more sophisticated, were building maps not just of 10 or 20 genes, but then 500, 1,000, 2,000. All of a sudden, even though computationally it was just a matter of scale, there was a place where the scale itself just finally exceeded the capacity of any particular human expert. And so then we started to see new kinds of uh, breakthroughs. Whenever you could look at interactions between 5,000 genes, you would see patterns that no individual who could look at like 20 or 30 genes at a time could find. And so in theology, yeah, there are certainly people that have, and unfortunately becoming less and less, but there are still people that have, you know, kind of an idea of major trajectories through theology, through through kind of the history of Christianity. Uh, but those take decades to come up with. Um, and so, um, but as you start bringing in more text, more minor figures, more interactions, bring in like Islamic influences and start building it, then it's, it's just kind of a, with the current technology and the matter of time and scale and scope, then we can actually start building models of, you know, 1,000, 2,000 significant text and look for patterns and ways in which they relate. 
So it's not guaranteed that we'll find something new, but it seems likely that we will actually start to actually find uh, aspects of theology that we've been studying for centuries that we haven't previously seen before. So some dimensions for expanding this, you know, I mean, certainly along the, the historical, uh, and I've, I've shown like one, two algorithms. There's, a, there's hundreds of algorithms that we can use for building models. There's different types of models. Um, and then there's different applications. So what I'm doing with Aquinas is kind of trying to dive deep, look at the model and find the relationships between the text. But we can also look at those topics and how they um, uh, shift over time. So look at, for example, how do uh, the, vir the virtues um, shift over a period of time. Now, if we're thinking about just the virtues themselves, there's kind of an understanding of that. But when we think about, when we're actually looking at some of the topics, so like the emphasis on, you know, the end things or more, uh, or, you know, uh, the end and, and his, his natural law, then to actually identify those takes a little bit more expertise than just reading through a text and finding a name of a virtue. And so those require a little bit more sophistication to follow those uh, through. So at least at first, um, um, the AI systems will be a tool. I mean, it, they're, they're not going to be able to analyze, evaluate, create on their own. But this collaboration between you know, humans that have a deeper understanding, theology, the computers that are able to highlight some of these texts, point to something that's, that's interesting, and kind of a synergetic, a synergistic relationship, will be able to kind of move that along uh, and create a, additional uh, um, insights into theology. So I want to kind of as I close to kind of tie it back to, like I, I started talking about this within machine ethics, and so can certainly use this as, an, as a way of uh, increasing kind of an academic understanding of, of moral theology, but then how can we take these kind of understandings and map them back into something that's going to improve the AI systems and kind of develop like a machine virtue ethics. So, uh, so this is again, you know, kind of like how do we make an AI system behave responsibly? So if we think about a virtue ethic at first, you know, it's kind of normative, it's character-based. Uh, normative always raises the question of whose norms, character-based, what does that look like in a robot or an AI system? But if we start, look, if we look at it a little bit closer, then uh, kind of three dimensions of, of virtue ethics are that it's dispositional, mediating, and teleological. So dispositional means that it, there's habits. Uh, there's patterns in which if, we, if a, per a person is virtuous, we're saying that there's a way in which they're going to respond to a variety of unknown situations. Well, for uh, AI uh, algorithms, I mean, they, that's kind of there. I mean, that's kind of what an algorithm is. It's a way of responding to a variety of inputs. So mediating, so, you know, that courage is a uh, kind of a middle way between foolhardy and cowardly. So, uh, so what that tells us is that, like for an AI system, then it needs to have a way of representing, you know, devices in addition to virtue. So what does it look like, you know, in a certain situation, say like an online, for someone to be a bully or for someone to be, you know, supportive? Uh, and then how do you mediate that? Or for a caregiving robot, uh, that say, uh, like a basically an uh, automated medic in a military setting, how does it do triage? So these kind of trade-offs are something that's hard for AI to do, but it's certainly a, a effort within AI is to make AI do better at that. And so virtue is both an interesting computational problem, how do you make those kinds of trade-offs, uh, with something that's good for AI in general to understand, it also then has a direct benefit to helping to make an AI system uh, you know, act in a more uh, ethical perspective. And then teleological, going back to Aquinas and, the, and basically the end, what is our purpose? So for humans, according to Aquinas, it's to know and love God. 
Well, we don't necessarily want to decide, say that's the purpose for an AI system, but the AI systems, at least now, I mean, we're building. And so it's to be explicit about what the purpose is. Is the purpose for, you know, caregiving? You know, one of the concerns is, well, what's the purpose of autonomous weapons? You can say it's for defense, but that's not its purpose. And so when you're specific about the purpose of a robot or an AI system, then you can start asking questions about, okay, so then what would it look like for an AI system to flourish? That's not something that can talk about in the abstract, but once we're specific about what it looks like for an AI system, uh, for the purpose of an AI system, then we can talk about its flourishing, talk about the ways in which that flourishing might line or not align with human flourishing, and, and kind of guide the AI system in a way that it would continue to develop in a way that would be flourishing. Uh, and so flourishing actually gives us a kind of a little bit richer way to think about an AI system as opposed to like maximizing some mathematical function. You know, it's bringing in broader context. It's still something that's concrete. And that's part of, of also working on this, even though I'm, des I'm describing it in terms of this is what we need to do to build you know, an AI system that can do theology to understand ethics. Even if the system itself is never built, just having the conversation about this is what an AI system would look like that would behave ethically can then help people that are actually building those types of systems. because. Unfortunately, the way things are, most software and engineers at Google who study computer science may never have had an ethics course before. You know, they may have only had one or two humanities courses in college. And so translating the, uh, the, richness, the richness and wisdom from the theological tradition into something that could be understandable and processed and built by those that are doing engineering is actually, a, I think, a valuable contribution. So uh, I think with that, I'll uh, end and uh, take questions. Thanks. You mentioned about you feeding Summa Theologica into the system. Have you ever uh, considered the challenge of the words being multivalent in meaning? Mm -hmm. And it's not one sentence uh, that are autonomous with each other. They tend to have a discourse where um, there is an argument build up. There is a little rhetoric flourish that was built into it. So my question is, have you thought about fitting something a little closer in text, such as Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics? That seems to be a little... Yeah, so um, one of the challenges with the modeling is that it actually requires, it can actually, even though you can't technically do it with, this, with smaller text, one of the benefits of using the, the SUMA is that it was a, a good size for this kind of model to give some kind of nuance. Now for the structure, even though in the topic modeling, it, it, it does not incorporate the structure. For the language model, um, it actually, I mean, it is tagged to identify like the beginning and the ends of articles and the next logical step would then be incorporate the structure so that you're distinguishing, you know, what er, what, argu what Aquinas is saying as opposed to the, those that he's actually uh, refuting. My pe um, just follow up on this yeah. one. One suggestion I would have, since you list the Bayesian model, you can use summa contragentili as a standard a priori model. Then you feed a more sophisticated model to refine that. Mm -hmm. Because let the machine to go wild among the data. It's going to do a lot of uh, false positives all around. Mm -hmm. um, so, just thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, thanks, Mark. This is wonderful to see you here. I have two questions. One is somewhat similar. Is that one of the bridges, it seems to me, of, of looking at this, the summa, either the summa or the conclusions or theology, is that it is intended as a didactic, um, where you find it um, fairly clear semantic references. What would happen if you're looking for when you're dealing with, say, irony or paradox in a way? Would, it kind of, uh, would, would, would that pose distinctive problems? And then a, a second question, Mark, I can still think of the first. It, it would seem that 
that sense of computational analysis, what really confirms, I mean, it's, it's about in the ways, that the meaning of the text will always exceed the mind of the author. In other words, where you have that possibility of reading texts in, uh, really for a sense of, of their historic development. And that seems to be very promising, but it would seem to confirm one hermeneutic approach over another. That mm -hmm. if you're looking beyond for the single mind to comprehend, to assess the meaning of the text, you're really looking at it's the way a text might be developed over generations, where it's the meaning of the text would exceed the lens of it. So two different questions. Yeah, so for the, so for the first one, <laughs> um, most topic models that have done in other areas have not been this clear, mm -hmm. where the top, you can clearly see this, this level of structure. Mm -hmm. So um, there is a certain level of organization to the SUMA that uh, makes it uh, very easy to evaluate. Mm -hmm. So there, there's, no, there's no tweaking done to this mm -hmm. model. This is like, I ran a, this popped up, I'm like, wow. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, I can, I can learn something from this, mm -hmm. whereas, um, if you look at something I mean, like Kierkegaard, you would imagine that just looking at the linearity of the text uh, at this level of granularity would not show this kind of pattern. I did do um, I did like a, di a different model looking at like Augustine's Confessions, and there you can see kind of the flow, and there's a very within his Confessions, you know. So scholars have noticed there's kind of three sections, the first nine chapters, the tenth chapter, and then 11 through 13, have very different styles. And there's questions about that. And that does show up. So at the kind of chapter to chapter level, you can see that even in something as kind of narrative as Augustine's Confessions. But I wouldn't expect to be able to go as deep. Um, but at the same time, if you take you know, something like this, then you can actually use this as a model for looking at other texts, looking at, at you know, contemporaries, look at Aquinas' other texts, look at later influences, or, or see if, if where, where these sources might be. Um, and so that's, that's kind of one of the uh, advantages of, of working, of starting with Aquinas, is that it's very clear what these topics are, because, I mean, these regions, uh, that are showing up, oops, um, uh, that are showing up, you know, like, you know, here, like, on happiness, I mean, you know, people have written volumes on just that section of text, and so that's telling me that they're talking, those are about that topic. Uh, and so at this kind of early evaluation stage, then it's, it's valuable to, to look at that. So, like, with the second question, yeah, so, uh, one of the reasons that uh, the computational models were working better than one might ex expect is that uh, we actually process lang language differently than like a naive understanding or historical understanding would lead us to believe. So if you think of like the, even just like the meaning of the word tree as referring to you know, a substantial form of tree or something out there in the world, then you would not expect for a computational model that has no interaction with the world to actually be able to come up with something that's particularly informative. But if, you know, kind of going like within the philosophy of language, like later Wittgenstein owned, then if language is about kind of the, the words and how they interact with each other, the relationships, the company they keep, then the meaning of a word is defined by the words in which it co-occurs. And those co-occurrent relationships are actually what underlies these different models. And so it's pulling out uh, the relationship. And different um, modeling framework, uh, latent semantic analysis, there's actually been, um, you know, psychologists have actually studied that it that some of the, the, the relationships formed by that modeling framework correspond in a, a few different ways to the way humans actually process the language. And so, um, so, the, so what was about the, um, about the kind of the, the meaning going kind of beyond the word. So the, the meaning 
being there within the language itself uh, is kind of fundamental to this approach. And then one of the interesting things of looking at some of these texts is because you can go kind of deeper. I mean, um, I mean these, a lot of these algorithms are run against like news feeds and Twitter. And so you can get a certain level of meaning, but you can't go deeper. And so one of the rationales for looking at theology for purely you know, academic, non-theological uh, reason is because these are texts that people have continued to mine and pull out, meaning out of. And so there's going to be a way in which to use you know, a series of algorithms and methods to pull more and more out. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, um one, I have two questions, uh, somewhat related to your last slide, but just a point off of that, what, what you were just saying there about um, about the kind of like I, I believe there's a huge compendium in the database, and I'm forgetting the name of it precisely, because I'm not church historian, I'm a theologian uh, in training. So, but there is a huge database that does some of the finds patterns and algorithm they use. So a lot of these codices and indices are, are already sort of put into you know, all the net. And then as historians want to search for certain things, things they can look for groups of words, or at least that's the goal. Yeah. Yeah. So they can get those nuances. Yeah. I, I don't know if you know that. Yeah, I mean, there, there's different, I mean, kind of a, just an interesting little side story. So the, uh, actually it was uh, some of the early work with using computers to understand Aquinas and the, the, the references between that, that actually led to uh, hyperlinks and kind of the foundation of the web. Mm -hmm. And so, um, using, uh, so there's certainly a long history of kind of the, the certain types of analysis, you know, using the kind of the ancient text that has actually kind of driven some of the technology. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, thank you for that. I yeah. Just to, but, um, my two questions yeah. are somewhat related. Uh, one is on the last thing you were saying about theological. Um, it occurs to me that you know Aristotle also has an idea of what a person is, the nature of a person that gives the world. And so I'm curious, you're, you're, it seems like you're really stumbling into the ontological question, what is the nature of a machine such that it might even have an independent will or self that needs to you know, flourish in some kind of particular way? Yeah. I, I just wonder if you so, avoid it. Right so there's, um, there's kind of two parts to, to that story. So one is that computers are getting more and more sophisticated. And the other one is we're getting a better and better understanding of how the human brain works. And if, if we had a brain like Aquinas assumed we did, where we were kind of you know, grasping the essence of a substantial form, um, then computers uh, would have, it would be very tough for us to build something that could grasp that. Whereas if you know, as we read, it's going through these different processes, e any one of which could be simulated on a computer, then at some point, um, the, there can be more of kind of a, a meeting of those. So uh, one of the other reasons to kind of, so one of the reasons of looking at uh, this kind of work in, a, in the context of like moral theology as opposed to just ethics, is that it does actually raise these questions of, uh, of the human person, you know, kind of even like theological, anthropological questions. So there is going to be, you know, over, certainly over the next 10 or 15 uh, years, questions of you know, who's legally responsible for an accident, the developers, you know, the machine, the, you know, the corporation behind the machine, the person uh, who purchased it. But, you know, that's just kind of a tip of the iceberg of what does it mean for an AI system to have moral culpability. Yeah. And the last thing related to that is, um, I'm wondering why not the, um, uh, uh, the board games approach, so I'll call it that. But, uh, it's, you know, give the computer, if you want to teach morality, it seems to me theology, ethics, and are ongoing conversations about unanswerable questions. And, give the computer an unanswerable question, it's sort of trying to break it, right? It, in a way, so you, you, the way our mind breaks sometimes, mm -hmm. and we're wrestling with this stuff. 
and perhaps giving, is that even something that anybody's thinking of? Well, so um, the questions that are unanswerable for us are not necessarily those that will be um, unanswerable for an AI system. Um, I mean, so like, um, I mean, an example would be, all right, well, so what's, what, what is it, uh, what's the purpose of a human person, okay? Uh, both either like ontologically all of humanity or existentially for an individual person. So that's something we have no answer for. Whereas for an AI system that was built, I mean like, it has a purpose, it may not be well articulated, but it still you know, kind of fits within that artifact, so it won't struggle with the purpose as much as it might struggle with questions of embodiment or something like that. So, so even if we imagine a, like, a sophisticated like artificial general intelligence, you know, like 10, 20, 30 years, the, the, in a sense, existential questions it would have would differ from those that we would have. Time for uh, one last question. So here's just uh, one. Uh, could AI put theologians out of a job? So we have talked about how uh, you know AI can replace drivers. So truck drivers will be obsolete in 15 years. Machinists. Yeah. Our, our theologians, could ethicists like Bill O'Neill be out of a job? <laughs> if, if, if we could, the cardio premise is that a, a, a computer, AI, might know the sumo better than Bill. Yeah. So, I think it's much more likely to replace the dean. <laughs> <laughs> so part of what the AI systems are going to be good at are doing tasks that are somewhat repetitive, you know, for us. And so, um, like, you know, part of, like, Bill's job of, of, of like, teaching different, teaching students, you know, decade after decade, over 30 years, well, you know, part even, like, online courses, once we record Bill, you know, kind of, you know, lectures, then those can be played. And an AI system can actually start to do some of the questions. So, um, but a total novel approach is probably something that is going to be hard. In part, not that the AI systems won't necessarily be more intelligent, but that they're not going to know what it means to be human. And so even like, with, I mean, using Bill as a specific example, like part of what makes Bill a good ethicist is like the time like in Africa and in women's prisons and this kind of social engagement. And so that's likely to be something that's very difficult for an AI system to do. At the same time, whereas like, you know, for Bill it took, you know, years to learn, you know, Latin and learn the Summa and to do all that, then the computer's going to be able to kind of squeeze that down. And so you can do, you know, quick translation across, you know, 50 different languages right now. And it's not uh, going to be as good as a human expert, but it's probably going to be as good as any human that's trying to learn 50 languages at the same time. Um, and so I think it's going to make it easier. And I think, I mean, like in the context of like the future of theology, just kind of given what's happening in academia, there are going to be fewer and fewer people that have the luxury of spending 50 years to learn you know, one subject. And so it may be not that it kind of replaces theologians, but actually enables theologians to continue to produce when they're needing to be able to do, to kind of uh, both comprehend these more complex areas with less and less time and resource. Okay, so I think your job is safe for a few minutes. <laughs> so I just have one last question. Can you go back to the first slide? I'm still trying to find the Dalmatian. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> did anyone else? Was, am I the only one? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, see, Oscar, too. <laughs> yeah, Oscar and me. Oh, listen, please join me in thanking Mark.